off the fence. I'm Fitch, and uh, I'm ready to get going here. You know, when we talk about mental health, I think it's, I'm not going to say it's equivalent, because I don't think it's equivalent, but when we talk about mental health, I often ask people this question. Are you mentally stable? Are you emotionally um, intelligent? And most times people are tell you, people are going to tell you yes. People are going to tell you yes. And um, I don't think they realize that they're not. So, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things where you, you need somebody to, to help you get through that. All right, guys, my guest tonight is an award-winning licensed professional counselor and women's empowerment coach by creating safe spaces for persons to heal. She has assisted hundreds of individuals in improving their mental health. And also, she focuses on supporting women and removing the blocks that stop them from living life to their fullest potential. And, you know, tonight, guys, me and her are going to have a fireside chat right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marquita Myrick. Hello, hello, Fitch. Thank you so much for having me as your guest tonight. Hey, look at you now. You look like you're on an island somewhere. <laughs> you have to get dressed up for these types of events. This is an event. And you got your nighttime voice on. What's your daytime voice? Put your <laughs> this, is my, this is my all the time voice. All the time. <laughs> your all the time voice? All the people tell me my voice is soothing, so you know you have to you have to keep up with that. So it really is. I'm, I'm like this here, like I'm drawing in. Like. <laughs> Don't fall asleep now. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. It, it, see, it, it's not gonna make me fall asleep. It's just gonna make me go closer to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like it's therapeutic. That's what we want. So <laughs> I think you're in the right profession with that type of voice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You ever so thought much. about doing voiceovers? I have not, no, but at the end of this year, I have something coming up that I'm going to do with my voice, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> what you going to do? Tell me about it. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be recording some things that people will hopefully listen to as they go to sleep and maybe when they get stressed, stuff like that. All right. Well, you know, here on Off the Fence, we help people scale, climb, and clear their fence. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about some mental health things, but I'm going to get to some of the fences you sitting on, too. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that. We'll see. <laughs> I think you were born ready. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I was born ready. <laughs> yeah. So, so you because, you know, in, in your profession of helping people, now, how long have you been in this profession? How long have you been doing what you do? Ten years now. Ten years. Mm -hmm. And what drove you into that direction? I mean, I know we're born, we, we, we grow up, we're taught a host of things in our lives, but somewhere along the line, the light bulb goes off and we say, okay, I want to do this, this, or that. And what made you choose this? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I love answering it because it was my own experience with anxiety and depression in undergrad that caused me to want to become a counselor. So I come from a small hometown, a small town in Louisiana, Hammond, Louisiana, and um, got depressed when I moved away to college, I was dealing with all the things, you know, the homesickness, the the, so, the isolation, just the culture shock, everything. It was a predominantly Caucasian university in Colorado. So I got depressed very quickly um, and very quickly had to learn that I needed some coping skills. <laughs> so started meeting with a counselor and long story short, I started to wonder during that process, how does this work? How did just talking to this woman help me heal some things that I had been struggling with? How did I start getting better? And so after I graduated, I, I just said, I want to do this. I want to help people in the same way that someone has helped me. Wow. OK. And I don't want you to have to relive it, but I kind of do because it makes ratings really good. So. <laughs> Let's go for the ratings. Let's go. Let's go for the ratings, right? <laughs> Because, you know, when you when you pull people in and you pull them off their cows and you make them the subject of the storyline, although they're not, it's good for ratings. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you get them to cry and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You got a lot of tissue right there, right? <laughs> I don't have any tissue. I've, look, I've healed my wounds. I've healed my stuff. So, <laughs> okay, cool. so I want to I want to delve real quickly into what caused your depression at, mm -hmm. at, at that stage in your life, at that age. You talk about going off to college. A, a time period where it seemed to be the one of the most enjoyable times of your life. You're leaving your parents' house for the first time, in some mm -hmm. cases, and you're on your own. So what, what in your words, 
um, caused your depression going off yeah. to college? Well, first off, I didn't want to leave. Um, <laughs> my, <laughs> I remember my mom and she's watching. Shout out to my mom. Um, she she told me, I'm clipping your wings. I'm going to release you like a butterfly. But she was tearful. She did not want me to go. And she would have preferred, she and my father, for me to stay and go to LSU in Baton Rouge. And that's what I wanted. I also got accepted into LSU. Um, but other members of my family encouraged me to leave. And they said, you know, if you stay here, you won't grow. And that was true. Um, so I left against my my best uh, <laughs> my best decisions. You know, I left and and it it worked out eventually. But it was very hard. I, I got depressed because I was homesick, no. um, you know, and then, and then you're young. So, you know, I, I left a, a love. I thought someone was the love of my life. Right. Left that relationship. And, you know, well, I don't have a boyfriend now. So now I'm lonely and now I'm gaining weight. Right. <laughs> I started gaining a lot of weight. And so then my self-esteem plummeted, you know, and then you, pl you pluck me up from him in Louisiana where, you know, majority of my surroundings were black people. And then now I'm around a lot of Caucasian people. So I'm like, I don't fit in. You know, I didn't, I felt like I didn't fit in with the Caucasian people. I didn't fit in with the black people. I didn't fit in with the African people. It, I was bound to get depressed. It, it was like prime. I was primed for it in that environment. Wow. I, I didn't know leaving your boyfriend at, at the tender age of 14 would cause so much problems. <laughs> 14? I was 17 when I left home. I turned 18 next summer. Look, I was grown. Yeah, Let me actually, do I was grown. Carry the one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That carry sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. Okay. So so when we talk about mental health, uh, is it safe to say that a vast majority of people haven't really identified what mental health actually is. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people, especially because the media makes it seem like, you know, if you have mental health issues, you're just crazy. You know, you're automatically you're depressed. And then that leads you're just suicidal. Now, now the people on the on, in the movie are, are har self harming. Mm -hmm. And it, it's more like a progression. You know, even for me at first, it was exciting. Mount, you mean to tell me there are mountains outside my bedroom window? You know, I have a roommate. I'm on my own. I have some freedom from my parents because they were pretty strict. Um, so initially it was exciting. Right? right. But over the course of a few months, my, my mental health started to, to go down. And so I think of it more as this continuum thing. Like we can go up and down with mental health. And yes, there are some extremes. You know, yes, there's schizophrenia. Yes, there's clinical depression, which I was diagnosed with um, back in undergrad. Um, yes, there are other things, you know, personality disorders and psychotic disorders, but it's not always that extreme. There are a lot of people right now, Finch, that are walking around with mental health issues and they don't even know it because they're they're like, you know how they call it, uh, what do they call it? The, the alcoholics who are just, they're coping, mm. you know? They're still going to work, they're still doing fine, but then when you get home, you break down. You right. know, when you're on your lunch break, you're breaking down. So, so yeah, it's, it's not always what it seems when we think of mental health. <sighs> So, so, because I, I see this often when somebody does something that we deem to be off the scales, automatically it's a oh, mental health is horrible. We, we we're not equating this to the fact that people just make dumb ass decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes people just make dumb decisions, <laughs> yeah. and and those can lead to mental breakdowns. All right, so let's talk about mental breakdowns. Um, what would you say is if there's one thing that could cause that, what, what would that be? Mm. Oh, one thing. I think that some people don't have enough self-care, but some people don't have enough self-awareness and they're not taking good care of themselves mentally, physically, emotionally. And that is a very ripe environment for someone to have a mental health breakdown. Um, it's really hard to pinpoint it because it could be a relationship. You know, you see on the news, people say, oh, I filed for divorce and or this woman filed for divorce. And then all of a sudden she's no longer with us, you know, and, and then there are five kids that are surviving that and the dad's in jail. And it's it's not just like there's partner violence on the side of the males and women do it, too. Right. But mm -hmm. it, it it's it's complex <laughs> because it's it's so simple, but it's complex because it can be so many different things. And if you're not aware of what's going on with you, you'll miss it. You will mm. miss that opportunity to get yourself some help. So, so you, you said a mouthful right then, <laughs> in, in your melodic voice. So, <laughs> so, 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 mental health in the space that it's in now, 
do you find that it's growing? The number of cases are growing or is it because you mentioned self-care. I think mm -hmm. that in a sense, too, is another one of those things that people are not aware of. I myself was not aware of the neglect of self-care that I was doing um, until recently. And it, it's so crazy because sometimes we just go through life and we just live. And we're so accustomed to this living that we don't realize we're not caring for ourselves. And especially if you're somebody who loves to care for other people, you enjoy caring for other people. You can get wrapped up in the caring for other people that you negate the uh, to, to simple thing is to care for yourself. Um, so do you find that that mental health cases are growing in our country? I do. Yeah, I, I find that, you know, it's so interesting because this is the first time since I've been a counselor where a majority of my caseload has has been black. I, I have never had this happen. And so with everything that's going on, of course, people are just recognizing the need to care for themselves um, in terms of their mental health. Right. Um, but in general, we're seeing it with schools. We're, we're seeing it with different cultures and different populations of people. People are having breakdowns. You know, people are spending more time at home and they're having a really difficult time. So I think it is increasing. And I think in some pockets, right, and I don't have the research on this, and mm -hmm. I imagine in two years there will be research on this, but in some pockets and in some areas, there were already issues that were being ignored, and the pandemic is just highlighting those issues. Yeah, the pandemic. Um, why do you think so many people are dealing with mental health issues during the pandemic? Because, I mean, you would think, I mean, now, again, outside of the the scope of loss of income, right? Mm -hmm. But I hear a lot of people talking about being in the house and not being able to freely go about. They feel in prison. Now you can go outside. You just might die from it, but you're free to go outside and, and as many times as often as you want to. But I, I find, why do you think so many people find it hard to deal with a simple thing as just staying home? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's grief and loss. Like when I think of it, we have lost our way of living <laughs> as, as life as we knew it is no longer. Things have mm -hmm. significantly changed. Um, and some people, you know, I talk to introverts and I have some teen clients who are like, I love doing my, my school work online. You know, I don't right. want to go to school and be around everyone. And some people are really, really suffering those more extroverted individuals because we've lost some of that human connection, you know, mm -hmm. even as I was at the grocery store before I um, came back home to jump on live with you and, you know, this guy said, you can put your groceries down. And I said, oh, I didn't know. Some people are really picky about their space right now. Right, you know, so I'm right. trying to keep my distance from other people in a way that I wouldn't have before. Well, that's different, you know, to feel like you can't even put your groceries down. So right. um, people are more weary of talking to one another, you know, trying to get together with your girlfriends. It's, it's kind of hard right now because some mm -hmm. people are skeptical about hanging out. I think life as we knew it is just different. Right. And so we have this piece where people are, are dying or being hospitalized. So there's the grief from that. And there's also the grief of life as we knew it. Yeah. Um, will life be the same for us ever again? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, You know, I don't know that it'll be the same, but I'd like to think that we are people that can evolve and we can we can make lemonade out of these lemons we've been handed with the pandemic. So I don't think it can be the same, but I think we can make something new out of it, create a now, new experience. And I agree with that. I, I think I think I believe when it comes to how we deal with life, um, I'm a firm believer that you can't undo things that's already been done. You have to adapt once once things have presented themselves in a certain light. And this life that we have right now, uh, unfortunately, has presented itself. Uh, it's it's going to be that way for the unforeseeable future, I believe. And so we have to make uh, necessary adjustments. Um, we've all had to do that, right? All of us. Yep. Yep. <laughs> How did the pandemic affect you in, in, in your work? In my work, actually, it, it was really good for my work. Um, I saw a significant increase. Um, I had been looking to increase my caseload. I, I'm a stay at home mom by day. I'm always a mom, right? But I do the stay at home mom job and take care of the kids in the home. During the day and in, in the evenings, I, I jump on podcasts as a guest. I, I see my coaching and my counseling clients. So 
it significantly grew. I mentioned, you know, my caseload just increased significantly, especially as all of the, the things that were going on racially were happening in the country, it increased. Um, so my business grew um, and I get that not everyone did. And I really right. feel for those who lost their jobs and their businesses suffered. Now, now when, when <laughs> this is going to be off topic. <laughs> when, when people hear you say you're a stay at home mom, do they automatically equate that you married a white man? No, they don't. They don't. It's <laughs> no. the first thing I heard in my mind. She married a white man. She married a white nope, man. I did not. No, nope, he, he is a chocolate brother. I love dark chocolate. So. <laughs> the crazy part is people don't think, oh, she could have married a, a, a nice, well off black man or an Asian man or a Latino man. Exactly. It's got to be a white man. Exactly. That's interesting. That people, you know, usually people think um, when I say stay at home mom, they do assume we make a lot of money, right? Oh, uh-huh. yeah, I must be rolling in the dough. Um, and they also assume that I don't work. People assume that stay at home moms, even if I weren't, you know, seeing clients in the evenings, it's still uh, a full time job to be a stay at home mom. Well, you know, you got to think about it like this, uh, Marquita, that we equate words to certain things in our life because of what we've been taught. So stay at home has all it has meant as much as we can remember a, a mom that doesn't work. And she just stays at home, takes care of the home, takes care of if they have children um, and, and those types of things. They, they see her as domesticated in a sense. And so mm-hmm. we just equate stay at home to you don't do anything. <laughs> it's like that's the crazy part about it. Right. That is the crazy part. I always tell my husband, I would love for someone to do a reality TV show, which is stay at home moms to show to show what we would do, what we do all day, because it's not an easy job. It's tiring. <laughs> all right. So so people who, who might hear this or watch this um, and they they're dealing with some mental health issues, you have three secrets to improving mental health. And uh, number one is what? Ooh, right out the back. <laughs> hey, you got to no, jump right into it, Marquis. You jump right into it. <laughs> you don't play games. Um, so the first thing is to become curious about your experience. Um, I find that, you know, a lot of people who come to me for their mental health issues, they, you know, I'll say, well, what has been going on? And they, oh, I don't know. I've just been crying. I've just been sad. And, and that tells me a person who is... Um, who lacks the ability to just say it, it was the breakup that triggered uh-huh. it. It was, you know, I lost a family member or, you know, I'm in between jobs or I don't like my job. That tells me that they haven't gotten curious enough about their own experience to figure out what's going on. So when you get curious, instead of pulling back and getting depressed and anxious and mm. you know, sleeping all day, you lean in and say, all right, you know, I'm a Christian. So I'm just going to speak, speak from that tone. But my God, what is going on with me? Reveal to me what what are the things that are contributing to this? And maybe even journaling about your experience during the week so you can go back and say, oh, yeah. All right. I had a difficult conversation with my husband on Wednesday. That's what's triggering all these thoughts and, and feelings and emotions in me. So that's the first thing. <laughs> so, so so let's let's repeat that again for the people in the balcony. So what, what's that term? <laughs> Get curious. Get curious about what's going on for you. Get curious about what's going on. Now, you know, when I think about getting curious, the first time, <laughs> first, when y'all heard that word, I'm thinking about, you know, you explore yourself getting curious mm-hmm. because that's what you, you think about. And when you when you really hone in on that, I like what you said about people don't identify what the cause is of something. They just say they just give you the effects. Right. They mm-hmm. just talk to you about the effects of what whatever it was caused. Oh, well, I just been crying. That's an effect of something. So what caused that, right? <laughs> Tell exactly. me what caused that, and then we can get to the problem. And, and, and I think, why do you think people don't don't dissect their lives in that manner? I think because it's hard. You know, if I think about, mm-hmm. I think if I think about my own experience, I didn't want to face the fact that that I was depressed. I didn't want to to talk about why. You know, okay, <laughs> because 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 there was nothing I could do about it unless I decided to move back home to Louisiana. Why am I different? I'm, I'm homesick, but I, I can't move back because I'm afraid of what people will think of me. You know, I had all these things going on, you mm-hmm. know, and so for people who um, are maybe depressed or anxious, maybe the stay at home mom or maybe the working mom. Right. She might be thinking, I know it's my marriage, but I don't want to face it because mm-hmm. if you face it, then you're forced to decide, am I going to make some choices that will lend a different result or not? 
am I going to stay? Am I going to challenge my husband on how he talks to me and how he treats me? Or am I just going to stay this way? So when we when we lean in with curiosity, we're saying, all right, I'm, I'm ready to find out. I'm ready to discover and explore this thing and maybe make some take some different actions. Get some different okay. results. That's hard for people. That's good stuff. All right. What's number two? Number two, address your fixed mindset. I um I love talking about mindset because a lot of people, well, let me back up. Some people might not even know what the term means. <laughs> so an attitude, a mindset is like an attitude, a set of attitudes and beliefs that you've developed over time. Um, usually it stems from childhood. And, and then as we become adults, we develop our own um, attitudes about things. And so a lot of people have these, these poor, this poor mindset. Um, this this attitude that they can't survive in life or they can't do better. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I experience this a lot in mental health. And I work with men and women. I know I talk about women a lot, but I, I work with everyone. <laughs> Whomever comes I was going to bring it like, up. I was going to bring up your bias. I was going to say, <laughs> I mean, because your bio said women's empowerment. I was like, well, what about the brothers? You don't do nothing for the That's- brothers, Marquita? Look, look, Finch, that's for the coaching. That's for the, the coaching. I'm a women's empowerment coach. OK, now for the counseling, I do have male clients. OK, <laughs> so. So, yeah, a lot of people have these mindsets that, um, again, don't lend to positive results. They they're, they're have a fixed mindset. They believe that their abilities can't change. Their life can't change. They can't do anything better than what they're doing. And if you're walking around with that mindset, it's detrimental to your growth. <laughs> you might want to work on getting a more positive mindset so you can start pursuing some of the goals that you have. All right, cool. All right. And what's number three? Number three, the biggest one. Are you ready? I, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You might want don't to know. You don't know. So the third one is just like reverse engineering. That's what I call it. So like if you if you have if you have an idea, right? Some people say, I'm not happy where I'm at right now. Right. Well, let's, let's reverse engineer it. So what, what does, and I'm I'm not going to have any bias this time. What does the man, (laughs) the future, the future male, the future Finch look like, I'm going to use you for an example. What, what would he do differently? You know, what would he be doing? So if he wanted to start a business, if you know, you want to start a business in the future, well, what would you be doing now? And so it's basically saying, all right, here are my, here I am. And here are my goals. And what do I need to fill this gap with? And maybe that involves talking to people in the industry. Maybe that involves um, researching what it looks like and steps that other people have taken to get to that goal. Um, But you basically reverse engineer it because if you don't do that, you kind of stay stuck where you are. And when you're stuck where you are, we tend to have a fixed mindset. We tend to not pursue our goals and not take any action on them. So those are my three, my three biggest tips. You are good. (laughs) <laughs> you are good i'm sitting here like man listen let me get on her couch today <laughs> it's only a virtual couch right now <laughs> okay so so if if people wanted to connect with you uh they wanted to in, indulge in your services how, how can they do so yeah thank you for asking people can find me on www.marquitamyrick.com or at marquita myrick lpc on facebook or instagram all right, so let's give give them the three secrets one more time. Oh, do I remember them? <laughs> Whoa! Oh, did you, okay, did I remember. You do those on the spot? <laughs> I re- no, I did not. I remember. Uh, one is get curious about your experience. Lean in instead of pulling backwards. Um, the second is address your fixed mindset, and the third is reverse engineer your goals. All right, Marquita Marek, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the fence and. Well, no, before I let you go, Uh I got to get your ass off the fence. So (laughs) you are embarking upon a new adventure, right? Yep. What are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? Ooh, okay. Um, You're talking about the adventure we discussed at the beginning? Uh Uh-huh. Yep. What's your fear about it? Because you have some apprehensions about it. I do. I I read people very well. You have some apprehensions about it. And... (laughs) You're unsure and see you for you, what you do in your life, you're always certain in certain areas. So you're yeah. good to go in those areas, right? Yep. But the areas that you're not sure in, you like, ah, I'm on the gray area. I'm in the. Ah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what are you afraid of right now? Yeah. The response from the Christian community. I'll be honest about it. That's what I'm afraid of. Yeah. Why do you care what they think? Because <laughs> it's for them. <laughs> it's for people who identify as Christians. And so, um, 
you know, I, I grew up, my dad was a pastor when I grew up and um, I'm in a different faith now, a different denomination rather. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, Christian people can be very judgmental, very, very judgmental. I've experienced that in and outside of the church. And so um, I think a lot of people have pulled away from the church because of that judgment. And so I know that what I'm planning and what God has put on my heart is just that it's, it's, it's on my heart. You know, my business is whole heart counseling. I do everything that I do with my whole heart. And mm-hmm. I know that it's inspired by God. And so I know that I have to be very careful about how I craft it and how I present and market it to the Christian population. And I know that it won't just be Christians that will be attracted to this, that, this thing that I'm producing. Um, but, but yeah, that's the fear and I'm dancing with it. I'll say that I'm dancing with the fear and God is working on me with that. <laughs> God ain't gonna work on you with that. That's the choice you got. You don't make. think so? You don't think he's gonna work on me? Because, <laughs> because, because again, in your belief system, he's giving you everything you need to do everything you're supposed to do. You mm-hmm. now have to make a choice to go do it without, without the apprehension of what somebody else is gonna say or think about it. Because that's holding you back. You're too concerned and con- concerned and consumed with what they're going to think. But you got to mm-hmm. realize that the God that you serve operated without mm-hmm. that fear. Right. OK, you preaching now. OK, so you have to you have to go out into the marketplace and you have to teach it. And if preaching is your thing, preach it and give the wisdom and counsel that you need to give the people that need it. And the people that don't receive it, shake the dust off and go on to the next town. Shake the dust off. Well, I like what you just said. <laughs> See, I'm going to still, still be prayerful, though, because. <laughs> It's happening. Let's put it that way. It's happening. It's on the goals list. I already know how it's going to happen. It's just, I just have to work with my fear. That's all. You have to work with your fears and, mm-hmm. and you have to, again, you have to adopt a mind over matter mentality. Mm-hmm. See, if you want to succeed at what you do, you can't, you can't ever allow the outside opinions of man to dictate how you're going to feel about your, your assignment and your quest. You just got to go get it. So a mind over matter mentality, Marquita, or Marquita, I'm sorry, uh, is <laughs> you don't mind what they think because it don't matter. And in it some cases, matter. they don't matter. You got that? I got that. All right. Now get your ass off the fence. I think you're a counselor or a coach. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go ahead and get off the fence and go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get you off the fence so you can be uh, good at what you do because a lot of people need to hear what you have to uh, offer. So you got to go do it. Thank you. I will. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a plum pleasure and pleasure as Les Brown say, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. All right, guys. Uh, so, so when we come back, we got more off the fence with fence. Don't touch that down. We'll be right back. Yo, 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 yo. You're in the mix. The world's finest, man. DJ. Just now. Like Half the radio on the telly. You're in the mix. Hold off the fence with Ben.